Hello, everybody. Dr. Duke, and welcome again to our next installment of our new lecture series, History of Human Dissection, Superstition, Science, and the Soul. We had a really exhilarating talk last time about ancient anatomy, the, the, philosoph the philosophy, the theology, uh, the modern premise, the scientific premise being born about why we should study uh, human anatomy, human physiology, dissecting human bodies in order to learn about living bodies. Again, to us in the modern world, it seems absolutely logical. But imagine being an ancient, studying the human body in ancient Greece like Aristotle longed to do, and having to come up with this idea that by pulling a dead body apart, you could actually learn meaningful truths about living bodies. That was something that was not self-evident to them. Uh, the, word, the, the word autopsy, for instance, right, means in Greek to see through something, to look through, to see inside of, to see through. And so even the language that we have, we retain in the modern world when we discuss dead bodies and how to go about processing corpses uh, for scientific study, much of that still comes from the ancient world. And we begin our study where we left off last segment with a reminder, a quick reminder about Galen. We didn't quite finish talking about him. Uh, probably for the medieval and renaissance period, the period that gave rise to the modern world, probably the single most important doctor in antiquity, the most important anatomical researcher. Not the most correct, uh, not the most philosophical, not the most insightful, but certainly the most dogged and the, the one name, Galen, who, who wrote so prolifically that his books came down to the Middle Ages. The, 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 he was a Greek doctor, Galen was, born about 129 or so of the, of the Common Era, AD 129 AD, died about 199, 200 AD. Uh, being a Greek physician, writing and working in Rome, uh, the Middle Ages had many, many versions, many copies of his, fav his famous anatomical works, all in the Latin tongue, which survived. He was a doctor living in the Roman Empire. He was also a physician to the emperors. Uh, he dissected, this is the key with, with Galen, despite his really comprehensive research program, dissected many, 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 many animals, uh, primarily apes and pigs, apes in particular, whose muscular structure, his myology, uh, whose bone structure uh, came closest to resembling that which would be human. Uh, but always remember, Galen did not dissect a human being. He was not able to, Rome had prohibited human dissection. He was not able to view uh, corpses and to pull them to pieces. He was, a, he was also the physician to the gladiators, if you remember by our next slide there, he was the physician to the gladiators. So whenever gladiators suffered terrible wounds, both, both gladiators who were able to be healed and cured and those that died, he got a momentary opportunity to look inside bodies that had been rent apart. Sometimes a, a shoulder would be hacked off or, or there would be a huge gash in the midsection from a, a gladiator's sword that would allow him to study, however briefly, uh, the interior workings of the bottle. But like uh, the body, like Aristotle, Aristotle before him. And all of the ancient anatomists that we looked at last time, uh, Galen was concerned primarily with teleology. His major concern was what was the, the final purpose of a thing? Not necessarily the form or structure of an organ or a skeleton or a system of muscles. Uh, he wasn't terribly concerned about what they did first. He was more concerned about what final purpose they served. In other words, teleology, philosophy, trumped what we would consider the genuine scientific study of the thing. And unfortunately, he passed this worldview down to the Renaissance, the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance. So about, for about 1,500 years after the death of Galen, you would have this the medieval and early Renaissance physicians, uh, medical men, looking at bodies teleologically. I mentioned to you last week uh, that for all of these doctors from... Aristotle and Heric uh, Hippo Hippocrates all the way on down through Galen into the medieval Renaissance period. The search for the soul, uh, trying to locate where the soul was in the human animal, uh, that superseded the basic anatomical knowledge that we would dissect bodies for, knowledge of structure and form. That was secondary to them. Uh, if you look at the uh, slide again, the major works of of Galen included a text on anatomical procedures, how to go about dissecting, and a very, very influential book called The Use of Parts. What was the use? This is that teleology I mentioned to you. What was the final purpose of the various structures and organs and tissues and materials he found in the bottom body? What was the use, the ultimate purpose of those parts? That worldview would shape for almost uh, a century, a millennium and a half, would shape for almost a millennium and a half the way doctors looked at bodies and body parts. Here we have a Renaissance, a early Renaissance uh, uh, 
visual representation of a number of ancient classical physicians. Notice how fancifully in the Renaissance they gave those Greek and Roman physicians uh, Renaissance dress, Renaissance hats. But there you have at the dissection of a pig, a pig has been, adult living pig actually, has been strapped to the table, chained to the table on its backside, uh, belly facing up. Galen, uh, with the knife in hand, leans over the body of the pig to vivisect it, to open the, the abdominal and the chest cavity. The, pl the pig would clearly bleed out. It would die uh, ugly and messy, but would give these physicians a chance to study the inner workings of the living organism as it died. And we mentioned to you that those two famous doctors, Her Herophilus and Erasistratus from Alexandria, Greece, uh, they were actually accused by Christian writers of the first and second century of having vivisected human beings. Here you see the vivisection of a pig. You see in the right-hand corner of the image uh, another pig being carried in on the shoulders of a strong young man to serve the next vivisection. And so we, we want to stress as we move from the ancient world, we leave Galen and we begin to look at medieval and early Renaissance uh, dissection, which is our subject for today, that everything you're going to see now up to Vesalius really was impacted by Galen. In fact, Andreas Vesalius, who we'll meet in a moment, the, the Renaissance anatomist, was really the first one to meaningfully challenge uh, the stranglehold that Galenic approaches to the human body had. So, for instance, we go to the medieval universities. Uh, the medieval university, the Christian university, born about the 10th century, the 900s AD. Uh, by nine, for, roughly from 900 to 1000 to 1100 AD, many of the major universities were being opened across Europe, and many of them had their beginnings in Italy. And what's really remarkable about the rise of the modern Christian university in the 9th, 10th, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries is how scientifically open-minded they were vis-a-vis -vis their own day. Uh, the argument that you could study the natural world at these colleges, these universities, that did not uh, run counter to the study of God. So uh, the universities were tremendous, gave a tremendous spark to the research in the human body. One of the most famous early practitioners of dissection in the early universities, the scholastic practice of dissection, was Mondino de Luzzi. Uh, born about 1270 AD, died about 1326 in the high to late Middle Ages, actually. Uh, the life of Mondino actually corresponds almost exactly for reference to the life of the great poet Dante Alighieri, who gave us the Divine Comedy. He was born in 1265, died in 1321. And right when Dante was uh, writing that masterwork, a work that looked all the way back to the classical world that was deeply steeped in scholastic philosophy of the universities, particularly from people like Thomas Aquinas, also you get in Dante an, an awareness of burgeoning medical practice, and you get it here too. Uh, in the, the Dr. De, De Luzzi, who produced one of the first uh, medi really important medieval anatomical treatises. Uh, he was actually given the name, Mondino De Luzzi, was of the reformer of anatomy because he helped bring uh, the study of dissection, dissected primarily animals, uh, like his predecessor Galen, like all men before him, primarily studied animal bodies. But the difference was is that Mondino was able to work with the Catholic universities, the Catholic Church, contrary to what the narrative is, uh, the modern narrative is, the Roman Catholic Church in these universities, these medieval universities, was very, very open to the possibility of scientific knowledge, particularly dissecting bodies. Uh, the Catholic Church had not banned the dissection of human bodies. It did not make it illegal to dissect human bodies. They regulated it very carefully. I mean, the Catholic Church had a, a profound stake in the state of the soul and the body after a Christian had died. You know, St. Paul had told us in the New Testament that one day body and soul would have to be reunited. So it was a serious uh, physiological, it was a serious philosophical and teleological problem for Renaissance and medieval doctors. If the body is in, indeed made in the image of man, and if St. Paul is right, that body and soul were going to have to be reunited at the last day when Christ came again, what did that mean for pulling bodies apart? What what did it mean that you took a human body uh, that otherwise was made in the image of God and you prayed over it, you washed it, you uh, had a mass over it, you buried it in a consecrated cemetery, uh, and there it would rest, so the hope was, until at the last day when Christ came again, the soul and the body would be joined. Well, now 
medical men, doctors, were beginning to take human bodies and disaggregate them, pull them to pieces, strip them down to nothing. You can imagine the somatic, the bodily, the somatic concerns, anxieties that such procedures might have uh, produced. But the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages was really quite enlightened about the premise of dissection. They, made, they struck a bargain with the universities. Uh, most major universities were able to access a certain number of bodies every year from the executioner. That made sense. We wouldn't dissect the bodies of average citizens uh, who would, were worried about the state of their bodies and with, with regard to the soul and the afterlife. So the church recognized that you had all these bodies being executed for various crimes, treason, counterfeiting, murder, uh, various, even theft could get you hanged. And so what they would do is they would, universities would petition the local bishop for the right to gather a certain number of bodies from the executioners uh, that they would dissect publicly for the benefit of medical students and for general education. Most times it was no more than four or so. Uh, the major universities of Italy would gather uh, at, 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 always during the winter, uh, there were very few dissections, public dissections, at the colleges that took place in the summer because the overwhelming heat of Italy just radically accelerated the decomposition of the body. Remember, they didn't have refrigeration back then. They didn't have the kind of modern embalming techniques we have today, or even the ancient techniques that the Egyptians had, as we saw last time. Uh, they didn't have that. So bodies dissected, particularly in the heat, they, they, they decomposed, particularly in the heat, quite quickly. So they were always pawned off until the winter months when it was slightly colder. And the universities would get their four bodies, uh, almost always from the, the executioner. And, and the, it's remarkable, the medical schools actually had the ability to determine the way that the malefactors were executed. A body that was going to be geared, uh, going to be set aside for the executioners, you wouldn't cut the head off it, for instance, nor would you subject it to torture. Uh, these were clean hangings. They were drownings or hangings. The church, the, the church schools, the colleges would request certain number of bodies, their, their allotment of four bodies, and they had a say over how the, uh, the criminal was executed, the felonious criminal was executed. The bodies would then be taken down from the gallows, or, take, or if the body had been drowned, they would be turned over to the beetles, the church wardens, who would drive the body body from the place of the hanging uh, to, the, to the colleges themselves. And these dissections were almost always public, which is really quite remarkable, open to the public, uh, civic authorities, not just medical men. And it was a remarkable thing. I mean, you think about the technology here. Today, we take it for absolute granted that we know what the inside of a human body looks like. I mentioned this in our first lecture. Uh, we know where the organs are. We know roughly what our skeleton looks like. We know what a pancreas looks like versus a stomach. But they had no idea what a human interior looked like. So when you had these medieval displays of the human body, it was at one and the same time absolutely captivating theater and terrifying philosophical consequence. Uh, it was one of those, like a car wreck, where uh, as much as you were horrified, uh, might even pray as you're driving by a major uh, car wreck scene for whoever was trapped in those cars. At the very same time, there's this human, human curiosity to see the spectacle. Uh, that was just enhanced when you had the whole interior of the human body on display in these dissections, especially when you consider what we've already said, that what they were looking for was the soul, number one. Are we going to, by dissecting a dead human body, are we going to put human beings in hand-to-hand -hand contact with the soul, with the remnant of the soul, with the place the soul inhabited? Which organ, which part of the body? Was it the head? Was it the heart? Was it the lower level? Where would you find souls in human bodies? It would take hundreds of years hundreds of years from the 14th century when Mondino was dissecting. It would take hundreds of years for doctors to exhaust the human body, to begin to make sense of what was inside of it, to begin to try to piece together its parts, its functions, its uses, um, dissecting on ever smaller scales to try to pull even more tenuous associations between the relationships of what was in the body. It would take hundreds of years before doctors would give up Really, it would be the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, uh, the early 1900s, before doctors really completely abandoned the idea that the human body would reveal the secrets of the soul. And so all through the period we're studying, from the ancient world well into the early 1800s, doctors were primarily concerned about the soul. And if the human body is made in the image of God, pulling it apart, are we going to learn more about the structures of God? These were legitimate concerns and issues for them. If we go back to Mondino, 
we see that he is the reformer of anatomy. After all those long dark ages years from the fall of Rome in 474 AD, all the way through uh, the rise of medieval universities about a period of about four or 500 years, there was no practical study of anatomy in the West at all. As a matter of fact, from the years, uh, from about 800 to 1200, uh, we're, our focus in class today is, uh, in this, this lecture series is on the anatomy and history of anatomy and dissection in the Western world. But from about 800 to about 1200, right? right before the, the medieval universities got rolling again on human dissection, the study of anatomy and physiology really transferred to the Muslim world. From about 800, uh, the, the, the Islamic empire had conquered much of southern, northern Africa, southern Spain even, parts of the Italian island, Sicily, uh, all across uh, the Middle East and into the Tur what we would call today the Ottoman Turkish realms. So Islam was really burgeoning culturally. Islam was founded in the 7th century. By about the 800s, uh, the imperialist and absolutely colonial nature of Islam, we need to remember that that did happen, well before you had European crusades, you had Islamic ones, and the European Crusades were trying to fight back Islam, not provoke Islam or conquer Islamic lands. That seems to be forgotten by our progressive historians today. But from about 800 to 1200, while the medieval universities were coming into existence and they were getting rolling, it, many Islamic doctors uh, were doing pretty complicated work off the ancient texts. Islam conquered Alexandria, for instance, in Egypt, conquered Egypt, conquered Alexandria, where the great museum that Herophilus and Erasistratus did their researches uh, so many centuries before. So that all of the classical learning of Aristotle, of Herophilus, of Erasistratus, of Hippocrates, all of that came into the possession of the Ottoman Turks, who then translated those classical Greek and Roman texts into Arabic, and they became pretty sophisticated. There's one doctor, one medieval doc, Ar Arabic doctor, who actually suggested the possibility that the blood, the pulmonary circulation of the blood, that the blood circulated through the pumping of the heart through the veins and arteries. That was done about almost 800 years before the English doctor William Harvey in 1618 proved it once and for all. To Harvey goes the credit, but this particular Muslim doctor working, I believe it was in the ninth century, I believe, uh, Ibn Ab Nifs, I believe is how it's pronounced, his name was pronounced, or Nifs, he was the one who made that suggestion well before the university universities in Europe were ever even established. And so the other thing we would say about Mondino, he was professor, professor of anatomy, again, in an Italian university, one of the earliest, the University of Bologna. He was the professor of anatomy and surgery there. And he was the first, why do we call him, why do we call him the reformer of anatomy? He was the first to incorporate systematic dissection in me medical studies. In other words, you couldn't become a doctor you couldn't become a physician without a course in dissection. So you had to experience, to some degree, the dissecting of bodies. And if you look at the picture uh, uh, this, this, um, uh, from his textbook, uh, his, his an Anatomia, his textbook on anatomy, you see that the way medieval doctors did their work. The physician is the man in the chair. He sits there ex cathedra. The physician has a copy of Galen's book open on his lap, as you can see. The physician would read from the text of Galen, Galen and then it would be the job of a, of a barber surgeon, an unlearned, uh, oftentimes they couldn't even read, an unlearned lackey, basically, basically a butcher in some ways, whose job it would be to open the corpse, and you can see he's done that, he's opened the corpse in the abdomen, and so it would be the job of the barber surgeon the man who, and we think of barbers, right? Uh, today a barber cuts hair, but back then barbers would cut hair, they would pull teeth, uh, they would engage, they would puncture or lance boils, they would do minor surgeries, they would open, they would bleed you, venesection. The idea that you could, you would cut, make an incision in a vein and you would bleed it to reduce fever or to try to balance out their understanding of how the human body was constructed. So barbers would do all of that. Here you have a situation where the man with all the learning, all the ancient languages, who had studied all the textbooks of the ancients that were available, the physician, he would never have dirtied his hands with the actual cutting up of a human body. And so there's a huge gap here between the person doing the cutting and the person reading the books. And as you can imagine, this caused tremendous problems. Let's go to our next slide. Here's another one of those images. You see again the doctor ex cathedra. Uh, up in his chair, right? He's reading from a book. He's lecturing from a book, almost exclusively Galen, Galen's anatomical researches. Now, remember, Galen only dissected animals. He never dissected men. 
But by the time you get to the 15th century, to the 1400s, many doctors had failed to take that into account anymore. So they took these physicians who read the books of Galen, they, after 1400 years, they started to just assume that Galen's dissections of animals were really of people. So you have this kind of absurd to our understanding, this absurd situation where there would be the doctor lecturing from the text of Galen. Uh, which was based only on animal dissections. It would be the job of the barber, and there you see him leaning over the corpse again uh, with a long, sharp knife, again ready to open the abdomen. Uh, the that would be the butcher, the barber's job, to find in the human body those things Galen said would be there. But the barber didn't know what he was looking for. He hadn't read the books, right? He was unfamiliar with the, the, the anatomy and physiology of Galen from animals. And so these displays didn't do much to advance medicine, right? They didn't do much. There was very little new being found in human bodies because the authority of Galen superseded the authority of their own eyes. The doctors themselves wouldn't do, the people who had the Galenic education wouldn't cut up the bodies, so they couldn't see how the body actually disagreed with much of what Galen said, and the barber doing the cutting had no access to the books. So this was in many ways a scholastic, this was an academic exercise. You have to recognize, though, that the barbers, although they were unliter illiterate, often unlearned, they weren't stupid. And there were physicians who they may not have cut themselves, dissected themselves, who were very eager to see if the body validated what Galen was doing. But for hundreds and hundreds of years, this is the way it was done. This particular image, our image here, is from Johannes Ketham, a, 13th, a 14th century figure. Uh, the image itself may have been cut a little bit later in the 1400s. Notice how the anatomy, again the dissection, is text-centered, not body-centered. The job of the, the barber was to find in the body what the text said would be there. It was not his job to find out what was actually there. The physician reads from his Galenic manuscript, the barber surgeon does the cutting, and this is designed to, all this whole procedure is not designed to tell us new things about the structure of man. Medieval, medieval church uh, uh, audiences, collegiate audiences, they believed that the ancients had a perfect knowledge of medicine, of philosophy, of history, uh, that they understood uh, doctoring much better than we did. So our job was to get back to the level of the classics. It wasn't to supersede them. If we move to our next picture, for instance, as we stay in medieval dissection for a moment, here you have a very early manuscript image of a, a barber, and you can see he's a barber. You can even see uh, the pains that the artist took to make the barber look like a bit of a simpleton. He's the one in the middle there in green. He's the one with the knife. He has an absolutely bemused look on his face as he has, very rare, he managed to find himself a female, or the church had bequeathed to the school, a female cadaver. These were very rare. I mean, you think about it. We talk about women's lib all you want, the patriarchy, how difficult women had it. Well, one of the things that women had a much better go at than men did in this period, the medieval period, was it was much easier to get executed if you were a man. Uh, men were routinely executed, even for things like simple theft. It was much easier to be executed as a man than it was a woman. So consequently, for every 100, 150 male bodies that came to the dissection table, you'd be lucky to get one female body. And so whenever you had a female body, if you look at our image again, it was a big deal. And the female body uh, was especially prized by anatomists because that's where conception took place. If you think about it, uh, in the womb, in the female reproductive organs, that's where life was in sold, right? That's where the human contribution to birth, sperm and egg, meet the soul. And the soul would, do the moment the sperm and the egg met in the womb of the woman, that's when God would ensoul that living being. So body and soul literally become put together in the female womb. And so the idea that you would dissect the female cadaver, such a, such a rare opportunity to do it to begin with, very hard to find female cadavers. And when you actually got one, the focus then did become this, because you want to talk about the soul and you want to talk about creation, you want to talk about God, man made in the image of God, what better place to do that in the place where all those things came together reproductively. And so you see in the image here, the abdomen has opened, the organ organs have been removed all the way down uh, to the lower parts of the anatomy. Uh, the bemused barber seems to hold what looks like maybe a liver in his hand. Uh, you can see uh, the picture above the cadaver. You've got what looks to be two lungs and a heart between them, and the physician seems to be interrupting the dissection on the part of the barber to make a point about human dissection. So again, uh, 
the, the real prize for anatomists, uh, looking primarily not for bodily pieces or parts, but the uses of parts, to quote Galen, the purpose of things, the teleology. And for Christians, the ultimate teleology was the soul. How does the soul make its way back to God? And so in medieval dissection, uh, here we have an image of a female cadaver, very rare, and all of the searching, the theology, the philosophy that supersedes the empirical understanding. Now we move into the Renaissance quite quickly, the early Renaissance. If Mondino de Luzzi uh, in the 14th and 13th century, if he is the uh, reformer of anatomy, then by all means, Andreas Vesalius of Brussels, he is the founder of modern anatomy. And there he is. There, he, there, there is the title page of his great book, uh, The Fabrica, On the Fabric of the Human Body. There is a portrait of, a true-to-life portrait of Andreas Vesalius. And there is a very stylized corpse that seems to be stood up and he is stripping away, he stripped the skin away from the forearm, and he is peeling the muscles, right, the digitorum muscles that allow uh, the fingers to close and grasp. This is a remarkable philosophical and spiritual statement too. The picture Andreas Vesalius wanted to be his authorial picture, the picture that demonstrates both his prowess as an author, importance as an author, and his uh, scientific research chops, if you will, is this one. Why the dissection of the hand? Well, think about it, right? The hand is the one thing, one of the main things besides the brain that really separates human beings from animals, right? This opposable thumb is a big deal. It allows human beings to play violins and guitars. It allows them to manipulate tools and to write with pens. And it also allows them to dissect with scalpels. Right? So by dissecting in the image, uh, the, the muscles of the arm, the forearm, that allow fingers to grip and close, allow that thumb to oppose this way, that's a statement about the unique position of the human being in God's creation. And the anatomist who dissects the hand is the anatomist who's calling attention to the dexterity of his own dissecting tools, right? his highly complicated, highly, highly uh, 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 precise human digits that can manipulate tools this way. So it's really quite a, a very stirring image. Vesalius was born in 1514, uh, died in 1564. He was born in Brussels, which was a, which today is a subset of Belgium. It's part of Belgium. In the 16th century, it was part of the Dutch Netherlands. 1564, 1514 to 1564. Uh, Vesalius dies the very same year Shakespeare is born in England. Uh, his name, Andreas Vesalius is his Latin name. Uh, in the Renaissance, and what happened between the Middle Ages? What happened between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance? Well, you have this rebirth of the classical world. What the medieval universities did when they opened. The medieval universities opened in the 900s, 1000s, 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. The universities all got started. They were primarily interested in Latin learning, biblical and theological studies, but they did open themselves up to the study of ancient science in the modern world. The Renaissance itself begins about 1250, 1300, 1350, depending upon the nation. Italy got it quicker than France, who got it quicker than Germany, for instance. Uh, the, that period from about 1250 to about 1500 is the period we associate with the Renaissance. And what was it? It was a getting back to Greek and Roman texts. What happened in the Middle Ages is, by the end of the Middle Ages, the, the study Hebrew was being studied for the first time in Western universities. Greek, original Greek languages were again being studied in the medieval universities, and the knowledge of Greek and Latin text had exponentially blown up. With the fall of Byzantium, the fall of Constantinople to the imperialistic Turkish armies, the Muslims, to the, with the fall of Byzantium in the 15th century, uh, about 1475, 1474, uh, down falls Byzantium. And, all, and what happened? All the Christian priests in charge of the great museums of Eastern Christendom in Byzantium, they fled west. And all of these priests and bishops and laymen and scholars, they, before they ran away from the invading Muslim hordes, they took with them all as many books as they could carry. All, and remember, Byzantium is Greece. It's, it's effectively the ancient Greek empire that Rome became after she fell in the West. All these Greek books, all these Greek texts were now in the hands of Italian and French and Spanish scholars. 
So all of this learning from the ancient world that the Western part of Europe had forgotten for a thousand years suddenly dropped into their laps from these Byzantine scholars who ran away from oppression, dumped the manuscripts. These Byzantine Greeks then also started teaching Western Christians the Greek language to be able to read those books, and boom, you've got the Renaissance, the Renaissance, right? It means the rebirth. It's a rebirth of classical learning. All of the great texts, all of the great knowledge of these ancient books going back as far as Aristotle were reborn again in the original languages. So the Renaissance believed that by studying Greek books in Greek language, we had some Latin translations of those books, but it was once removed. They believed that by studying these Greek medical documents, for instance, in the language that they were created would give us a better understanding, an even further understanding. So in a way, the Renaissance, by definition, is generating new knowledge by looking backward. And that makes sense, right? We saw in the Middle Ages how Galen hung on. He was even hanging on here a little bit. Besides being the founder of anatomy, uh, Galen is the, was later a physician, just like Galen was a physician to the emperors. Uh, Vesalius, too, became the physician to the great emperor Charles V. All right? And so if we move a little bit forward, we think about how this impacts everything. What is the great contribution of Andreas Vesalius? What did he do? Primarily what he did is he wrote the greatest anatomical textbook the world had yet seen. The title of it is On the Fabric of the Human Body. And there's a picture of the, an actual copy of the 1543 edition. Uh, that's the year. Fif what a year 1543 was. Uh, in 1543, not only did uh, Andreas Vesalius write the first really modern anatomy textbook. It was modern in the sense, as we'll see moving forward a little bit, that it had modern illustrations, it had very modern pictures in it, based on the actual dissections of Vesalius himself. Not only that, though, in the year 1543, that's the year that Copernicus made the argument that the sun might not be the center of the universe excuse me, the earth might not be the center of the universe, the sun was. And so you can see what a traumatic scientific year 1543 was. For the first time since antiquity, and even before that, the Ptolemaic astronomy of the Alexandrian Greeks, the Ptolemaic astro astronomy made the argument that the earth was the center of the universe, everything revolved around the earth, including the sun. By 1543, after reading those ancient texts, uh, Copernicus begins to consider the possibility that maybe the sun's the center, not uh, the earth which has really profound theological implications for a Christian world that believed that God made the world and everything in the universe for man. Man might not now be at the center. And one step worse, besides what Copernicus was doing, you have what Vesalius is doing. Uh, the microcosm, the image of man made in the human body. Uh, the ancient, the Christians believed uh, that ma man was the span of all things, that inside the human body, you could find everything that God had put in the universe just contracted to a span. So mountainous places, the bones, liquid places, the watery places, everything that was in the universe was in the microcosm. And in 1543, not only was the sun displaced as the center of the universe, took a couple hundred years for that to really sink in, so too the human body uh, was being pulled to pieces in the name of science. This is the most influential anatomical textbook in history. In the book, what does Vesalius do? He begins to, for the first time, to seriously take issue with Galen. He argues, he reminds the, the Renaissance medical establishment, something they had forgotten, that Galen didn't dissect human beings. It's amazing after 1400 years, how many physicians just, to, even though Galen makes it very clear he didn't dissect human beings, how that, the idea that he did had become part of the anatomical lore. Vesalius took that on. He looked inside bodies himself, unlike medieval dissection. He got rid of the barber surgeon. He took the knife and the scalpel in his own hands, and he dissected those bodies themselves, and he compared them very closely to what his actual eyes could see. So he prioritized physician dissectors, not barber surgeons. He stressed faith in observation, empirical observation, what the doctor could see, not putting your faith in ancient texts. In effect, he reversed 1,400 years of Galenic claims. Just to give you a couple example, uh, examples, Galen had argued very vociferously that the veins and the arteries did different things. 
that the arteries, he argued, were responsible for bringing purified blood to the brain, whereas the veins brought lower level blood, less, less re refined blood to the lower parts of the body. Of course, we know that's not true. But for Galen's system to be right, that's what he believed. There had to be little holes or openings or pores in the ventricles of the heart that would allow this uh, upping and downing. Of course, they don't exist. Uh, and Galen, because he never dissected human bodies, number one, and number two, he had to come up with an argument for his philosophy of pure blood, right? He had to have an anatomical basis for it. So he argued that these holes existed in hearts, right? Galen, or Vesalius, was very careful to look at the heart specifically, and he could never find them, right? And so he began to conclude that this whole system was bunk. And so he disproved Galen on what the purpose of the arteries and the veins are. He also, Galen, we mentioned, dissected lesser animals. It, at, in the, at the base of the skull, the base of the brain, in ruminant animals like sheep, for instance, there's a cluster of blood cells, a cluster of blood vessels, blood vessels that anatomically have been named the reta mirabile. They don't exist in human beings. And because Galen never dissected human beings, only animals, he insisted, Galen, that that collection of blood vessels would be found at the base of human brains. Galen, because, because Vesalius had the book in front of him and he had his hands in the cadavers, he recognized that no such, uh, no such cluster of blood cells, uh, blood vessels, no such reta mirabile li existed in human bodies. Another way of the jawbone. Uh, many of the animals Galen dissected, the jawbone is two bones that come together to make one. We obviously know uh, that the human jawbone is one solid bone. Another way that Galen's expertise was decentered, and you think about what a serious deal this was. All authoritative medicine, all authoritative surgery was based on what Galen said. And here comes this upstart Belgian saying that Galen's wrong. I mean, you can imagine. Imagine today. What happens today in the Islamic world, which in some ways is this world. The Islamic world is still the Middle Ages. Uh, culturally, they have not, uh, and politically, have not advanced much beyond the Middle Ages. Think about what happens in the, in the Middle East today when a Muslim imam uh, makes a statement based on the Quran that is contrary to common sense, logic, science, right? The tendency is, is for uh, the religious authority to supersede the scientific proof. And that was what happened in the 16th century when Vesalius made these claims. We move to the next slide. This is the fabrica. The title of the body is De Fabrica Humani Corporis on the fabric of the human body, De Libri Septum, in seven books. Seven long books bound into one volume that becomes the fabric of the human body. You can see the title page here. It is a frenetic public dissection. Think about how the universities have blown up now since the Middle Ages. This is an actual public dissection. You can see it's in the round, right? The building that houses it is like the Pantheon. It's a nice round building. You can see the way it curves, held up and supported by classical pillars. You can see all of these people teeming into the anatomy theater to watch this dissection. And it's all the more enticing because you have a female cadaver. These, this is also revolutionary about this, is of course you didn't have photographs in, in Vesalius's day. Vesalius did a remarkable thing. He found a high quality artist to team up with. He would, do, he would dissect the bodies, oftentimes with uh, the artist present. And they would, the artist would sketch, sketch the structures, sketch the bones, sketch the muscles. So you had a first-rate artist, a man by the name, uh, we should say a second-rate artist, a fellow by the name of Jan van Kalkar, who actually was a student of no less a figure than Titian, one of the four great Renaissance artists, right? So van Kalkar worked in the studio of Titian. He partnered with Vesalius to be able to present not just the research, but the research in a way, highly refined, highly sketched, very true to life. This now, this textbook represents the union of research, design, and aesthetics. The research of the doctor, the physician who now does the cutting, the physician who banishes the barber surgeon to become the dissector himself, the design, the teleological design of the human form, and the artistry of a great, great painter 
a, a woodcutter, drawer, right, who could then put together uh, and, re, re, and, and leave a legacy for students now who couldn't access bodies. In Vesalius day, uh, you really couldn't get many more corpses to dissect than they had gotten in Mondino's day. There was a limit, you had, there were only certain times of the year you could dissect, and you could see how frenetic the scene is here. In other words, what you've got at the audience here is civic, religious, and academic people. So you've got people from the college, You've got people from the religious orders who show up to see the dissections, and you've got the civic authorities, not to mention curiosity seekers and gawkers. And what a, uh, no, what a loud, noisy, uh, messy place, right? There were no, nobody had rubber gloves. There were no way to sanitize your hands. Uh, this was a big, huge spectacle to look inside the human body at what God made. If we go to the next slide, this is the top part of the title page that you just saw of the Fabrica, the top section. Notice that you have oh, superseded on the image itself is the family crest of Vesalius in the language, right? Uh, his name was Van, Van Wessel. Wessel is weasel uh, in the Dutch language or a version of weasel, uh, the family name. And so you see there the two cherubs holding up at the center a crest that has three weasels on it, Andreas Vesalius. Again, in the Renaissance, it was customary for uh, scholars in medieval and Renaissance Europe to Latinize their names as a, uh, a way of hearkening back to the classical world. So Andreas Vessels, becomes Andreas Vesalius, a Latinized Roman version of the name. And there's the, uh, so we, what does the cartouche, the little plaque say? Andre Vesalii, right? Andreas Vesalius of Brussels. Uh, the, it talks about the University of Padua. This is the University of Padua where these dissections took place, right? A professor at the University of, Pada, of Padua and his book, Humani Corporis Fabrica Libri Septum, on the fabric of the human body. You've got the onlookers up above at the top, looking down all the way at the top of the building, looking down above uh, sort of the load seats on top. You see the little I-O above the head of the fellow on the left? The publisher's name was Johannes Apparinus. Uh, of course, they didn't have the letter J in Latin, they had the letter I. So an I with an O surrounding it tells you who published it, Apparinus, right? And if we move to the, ne the next one, this is the central scene, a little close-up version of it. Notice what you have on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, you have a naked man hugging one of the pillars. On the left, the right-hand side, you have a fully clothed man hugging the pillars. And what this suggests is different kinds of anatomy. Uh, the, man on the, the naked man on the left signifies the naked body, the body of the dead man, or in this case, woman, who would be offered up for anatomy. It's a symbolic figure. If you look at the figure on the right clutching his pillar, he is wearing elaborate stockings that seem to be slit. Well, you could look at them that way, that the leg of the man that you can see so clearly that's holding the column on the right, either he's wearing elaborate hose or he represents a le his leg represents a leg that has been flayed. The skin has been removed to expose the muscles beneath. Uh, practical and theoretical anatomy are represented here on those two pillars, right? You can see at the very top where the cartouche that we just read you, that overlapping crest hangs down. And you notice something really interesting. At the center of the scene, you have the anatomist, you have the body of the female cadaver, and you have her womb opened, right? He's making a statement here. The in fact, funny thing, you see Andreas Vesalius. He's the bearded man with his hand, his right hand, in the womb, in the open cadaver of the female body, right? And he is the only figure in the whole of the image that looks at you, with one exception. So Vesalius has turned his head, he's looking at you, the viewer, He's looking at you, he's watching you, Vesalius, as you watch his hand explore the place where body and soul in the human animal comes to fruition. He is examining that place in a female cadaver where body and soul come together for the first time through God's power. Uh, this is a powerful declaration. It's a theological de de explanation. It's a philosophical declaration, spiritual. It's also a scientific one that this particularly brilliant researcher, he, with his own hands, is exploring the seed of creation, the, the womb that houses the created life of the new human being. That old man at the bottom right, who seems to be turning away from the dissection, and notice what he's wearing. He seems to be long beard, 
unlike many of the other figures in the image, long out of style beard, and he seems to be wearing a toga. That's Galen. That's Galen, who Vesalius has now supplanted. Notice that Galen turns his face away from what's happening on the dissection table, turns it away very violently. He will not look at these actual dissections. In fact, we'll see in a moment what he's looking at. You can't see it in this image. He's looking down at a dog and a goat. Animals that would be vivisected after the dissection. So after the dissection of the female body, right? After they saw what they could in a couple of days before the body turned really bad, they would then bring animals in and vivisect animals as a further lesson beyond what the body was able to show them. So there is your anatomist with his fingers in the womb. Galen, who he has supplanted, has turned away his view, doesn't want to look at it. And the, perhaps one of the most interesting figures is the, is the human skeleton. Seated above both the anatomist and the cadaver is the memento mori skeleton, a philosophical reminder of death. And he carries a scepter. And the line of the scepter that the skeleton carries bisects the womb itself if it were to be carried down to the end of the picture. And so who really is the star? And notice how the skeleton, the memento mori philosophical remember man that you are dust and to dust you shall return skeleton, the philosophical warning about what happens to us all, that dominates the image. It's the biggest thing in the whole picture. And notice too, all the frantic people who are gathered around the skeleton trying to see the dissection, they ignore the skeleton, they don't even see it. One man is peering between its arms, trying to look below. The point here is that they are absolutely these men, they're ignoring the philosophical because they're so caught up in the empirical research aspects of the dissection that the big memento mori skeleton that dominates the scene, they're not paying any attention to it. If we scroll to the next point, here's a, a, a much closer image of that. Notice what you have here. There's Vesalius with his fingers in the womb, right? There he is looking out at you. And remember what I said, if we go back to the previous image one more time, the only other figure in the picture looking out, looking out at you, not obsessed with what's going on, is the skeleton. The anatomist, who is a scientific researcher, and the skeleton, which is a reminder of mortality and spirituality, those are the two things that are looking at you and nothing else. If you go back to that other image, right? There he is in a close-up. Uh, you see, now you can see Galen, right? The old Greek man, the Roman, looking down at his animals, right? He preferred to dissect animals. He had no access to human bodies. He turns back to his animals. On the left-hand side, notice what you get. You got a man, a monkey tamer. There's a man there in the bottom left-hand corner, and he's got a monkey. And the monkey has bitten the hand of one of the spectators. The spectator looks down kind of in surprise. It pulls his head, the spectator can no longer look at the dissection, his attention has been pulled away by the monkey. This is a moral lesson that Vesalius included in his work. If you base human dissection on monkeys, not men, you will be bit. If you base your human dissection on the dissection of monkeys, not of men, you will have your attention turned away from what Vesalius is showing you. Notice on the table next to the cadaver, right under Vesalius's hands, you have a snuffed out candle with the smoke ascending, right? That's an image of the soul. The soul has left this body. And underneath the table, most remarkably, uh, Vesalius is, he is signaling the power of his new method. Underneath the table, you have a barber surgeon on the right, a barber, the man who in the Middle Ages used to do the cutting, a person who had no familiarity with the ancient languages, who had not read the medical books. Now he has nothing to do. He's been banished from the scene. He sits there under the table with his razor, right? A symbol of his hair cutting, right? He has been demoted back to his place, a place of relative insignificance in a scene where the physician bravely does the dissecting himself. It is a shocking image all around when you stop and think about it. Go to the next image real quick. And this is where we'll pick up because this leads, this springboards us to our third lect lecture. Uh, I wanna uh, end with the skeleton. We, we saw the memento mori skeleton in, in the dissection scene of Vesalius and it was purely philosophical. 
right? The skeleton, going back through the Middle Ages, the image of the skull, the image of the skeleton, that's what was the reminder to people during the plague years when death was so common. You remember almost uh, up anywhere from 25 to 40% of Europeans were wiped out during the Black Death in the 14th century. The human skeleton, the human skull became a reminder to people of their spiritual well-being. Your body's going to die so you have to, and you'll become a skeleton. And so you have to start worrying about your soul now. Let's close with that picture one more time. You look at that skeleton. What's different about this and the Middle Ages? Now the skeleton is more or less anatomically correct. The skeleton there is in a medieval pose. It's just like the one from the Vesalius title page, right? It's in a philosophical, spiritual pose, but it's now anatomically correct. And we're gonna talk about in lesson three, we're gonna talk about how uh, we move from spiritual to empirical, how uh, during this Renaissance period, the philosophical and the spiritual, the humanistic that were so important to the Renaissance, now begin to intertwine themselves with the, the burgeoning new scientific empirical way. And you get a kind of a golden age where scientists were philosophers and philosophers were scientists, where philosophers and scientists both were devout Christians who subordinated their natural uh, philosophical understandings to the higher law of Christ. Remarkable, and we'll see you next time.